Thanks for coming. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. This is awesome that you're ready and excited to get ready for the semester to start. I know we at Dunn are all can hardly wait until the 21st. Um, and make sure that you, uh, yes, enjoy, continue enjoying your lunch. There's cupcakes for dessert. They are chocolate, chocolate, no gluten free this time. Um, maybe. Um, homemade by you. Homemade by me. Um, they're an old family favorite recipe. Um, they're, uh, Mrs. Moore's chocolate coffee cake. If you really want to mess with <laughs> anyway, um, make sure you sign in our sign-up sheet. Oh. So just so that we you can do it on your way out. Came. Yes, it's not perfect. I just want to know who came and if we had any follow-up information, um, or questions, or something that came up today. We can quick shoot everybody an email that was here today. So um, that's why we are interested in knowing, um, who came. Um, today's uh, session for Christmas all kicks off our academic year for the 2017-2018 year, and we're talking about academic integrity. Um, we're hoping this is going to be a two-part session. First part, um, where we're going to be talking about with uh, Alan Kimmel, who is the assistant professor and associate um, head of the undergraduate studies in the Department of in, um, Material, Material Science, I'm um, engineering. He's going to start us off, and we're also going to hear from Stevie Rocco, who is assistant director at Dutton, and April Malay, who's learning designer in Dutton, and talking about um, ways that we can try and prevent and motivate students not to cheat in our courses. Um, and that's what we're, we're, our goal is today, really hoping that we can look at what does it look like to cheat. Um, we understand all the ways that um, what cheating is. Um, and then also looking at what can we do just easily um, to prevent you. And then next month, we're hoping to talk about what happens if you do have people that cheat in your class. So any questions that you have about what do I do with that, save those questions for next month and we'll um, address those. Anything that I miss? Okay. Uh, we're going to- I'm first. You're first. So Stevie is going to start talking. And welcome. Okay. Um, April oh, did these slides. Sorry. Yeah, go. We are recording the session. <laughs> you make sure that I mentioned that. So yes. there were, before anybody says anything, they were looking at. Right. There were several people that asked for the presentation. So this is being recorded. Okay. Thank you. April did these slides. Full disclosure. So I just need to give credit where credit's due because if I didn't, it would be cheating. Um, <laughs> academic integrity. We're, this month we're talking about prevention, about how to limit opportunities for cheating, and then. Next month is, again, about policing, catching, and punishing cheaters. Um, I went the wrong way. Let's go this way. Um, so there are five types of cheating um, that we deal with. This is information April found. Plagiarism, that is taking someone else's work and claiming it as your own, either accidentally or on purpose. Fabrication, um, fabrication is creating data and facts, things that you might need to support your argument, just making it up whole cloth. Falsification is data driven. Data driven. Data data. Okay. <laughs> and then misrepresentation. Misrepresentation is uh, finding something that works for you and making it work for you, and it has nothing to do really with what you are supposed doing. to be doing. <laughs> and then misbehavior. That could be almost any nasty. You know, anything that in a class is disruptive. Okay. So. I'm going to start by talking about last year's university level academic integrity committee. Many of you may not even know that this committee existed, but I was on it. Um, there was a university level, it was called the proctoring committee, but it, you know, it's so tied into academic integrity. We ended up doing a university wide survey in last fall. You may have seen it. You may have even filled it out. If so, I thank you. It was sent to all colleges and campuses. We had 1700 respondents take the survey. There was big interest. Um, 24 different locations. 55% of those respondents were from University Park. The second most uh, responded from campus was Harrisburg, which kind of makes sense. It's a larger campus. Behind that, it was Abington, which I found fascinating. Like we had 60 people from Abington fill out the survey. So clearly there's a high concern there as well. We had we collected data on over 1,900 classes in that survey, and the res results were kind of interesting. First, um, class size. You can see that we mostly had 
class sizes in the 11 to 30 range and the 31 to 50 range. So if you say 11 to 50, that's over half of the responses there. And then 51 to 100 was this purple, and then the 12% is 101 to 300, very small slice of over 300. That makes sense when you think about only University Park is gonna be reporting really large classes anyway. So it makes complete sense. Um, so 59.4% were between 11 and 50, 35.6 over 50. Um, mostly it was undergraduate, like 86% of the responses were about undergraduate classes. Some small slice, 4% were both undergrad and grad, and then a small slice of graduate students. Um, when we looked at the Pollock Testing Center, this was interesting. The number of University Park faculty who responded that they used the Pollock Testing Center was really small. Only 51 of the 904 people responded that they use it. But 850 people responded to the follow-up question that asked whether they haven't used the testing center because they couldn't book it, right? So of the people who said they haven't used the testing center, 14% or 110 people said they don't use it because they can't get in. It doesn't, they can't get booked because it's always full. Um, so even though that seems small, that indicates a fairly large number of students aren't figured out, or aren't being served because of the testing center's books. So what we did was we assumed that the enrollments were in the middle range of each of these things, and for over 300, we said it was 300. And so we said, okay, if 14%, we took the 14%, we assume only one exam is given per year, right? And we took the middle number of enrollments, that means that like 26,000 exams are not being served by Pollock. And that was only based on the respondents who answered that question. So I personally think that this shows that we need another solution because the Pollock Testing Center is not serving enough exams for people who need them. Um, then we asked if you would be likely to try an online proctoring system. And of those folks, uh, 1,480 people responded and 66% said that they were at least somewhat likely to try such a system and only 34% said they wouldn't try it. So most people seem that they would at least try it once. Trying a, pro a proctoring system or an online proctoring? Trying an online proctoring system, yeah. Um, then we asked about their concern about academic integrity. And then we, we figured that out by like a bunch of different things. So nearly half of all respondents indicated a moderate or stronger level of worry about academic integrity. And over 85% of faculty members teaching classes of over 300 students were at least moderately worried. So, I mean, that makes sense too, right? The larger the class, the more you might worry about academic integrity. Then we asked about their concern by discipline. And this was interesting. People with a moderate concern or higher, and our college kind of spans disciplines. Um, engineering and natural sciences, 53% indicated a moderate concern or higher. Uh, formal sciences, 51% had a moderate concern or higher. And social sciences, 50% had a, a moderate concern or higher, which was interesting. This is all also in a report that I can share if anyone really wants to get into the nitty gritty. What's really interesting is then we asked them about the confidence they had in their own assessment strategies to prevent academic integrity issues. Engineering, you remember they were concerned, right? 81.6% of them are moderately or fairly confident in their assessment strategies preventing cheating. So even though they have a moderate concern about academic integrity, it's clearly not happening in their classes. Um, and the same was true for every other discipline. Engineering, 81.6%. Natural sciences were 80% confident. Formal sciences, 81.6. And social sciences, 82.3. So I don't know if that means that people are really sure that their students aren't cheating. I just know that their level of concern about cheating and their confidence in their assessments, there's a mismatch in, in that. The really uh, uh, sad thing there was this answer, I've never considered whether or not my strategies help to prevent cheating. So there's a, there's a large number of people, 7.9% of people in the arts, maybe that makes sense because of what they do, 5.2% in education, you'd think that they would be Right, so I, I don't know, I just find that fascinating as a, as a thing. So to move on, the committee recommendations were these five things. 
we said that the university should adopt a university-wide online proctoring system at the enterprise level. You may have heard that Examity was approved for use by anyone at the institution. It was moved through World Campus. They were currently paying for it. So if any department wants to use it, that's fine, but the department gets charged for the use of Examity. It's not really an enterprise level solution. And the cost for Examity is somewhere between $12 and $17 per exam per student. So it is not a cheap solution. I, yeah. I have a question. Can you give paper exams with an online proctoring system or only computer exams? Because I give, I mean, paper and pencil exams. Right. That's how that's what you field, do. Yep. And that's how my field does it. Okay. So if you can't write down things on paper and pencil, pointing right. and clicking right. is fine. They get right. that enough. But I mean, so it has to be a, a in in class. Doctor. It might have to be an in class or in the Pollock Testing Center, but there would be certainly much more space if other people didn't need it. Did this? Yeah. 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 I mean, I just in my That's true. in yeah. my classes are just online exams. Right. I, I could see how Proctor Track could. Yeah, Proctor Track could do an online exam just because of the way their algorithm works. But well, even a paper exam. You think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, we also recommended that there should be a broader dissemination of other tools that instructors can use, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. We recommended that the university do a regular review of academic integrity tools and disseminate that to university faculty members. I found out a lot of things that people didn't know about. Um, one person who would said, and I was diving through the, you know, deep into the data, one person said they give paper exams or they give papers a lot. And then when I asked them if they thought there was a question on there that asked them about, do you use Turnitin to check your papers? And the open-ended response was, I never thought about using Turnitin to check my papers for plagiarism in my class. So I thought, well, okay, teachable moments. Somebody now knows they can use Turnitin. So that's good. Um, we want to provide better guidance around study sites. People have heard of Study Lab and Course Hero, where students will upload completed tests, completed homeworks, completed labs, and other students can pull those down and use them. We feel like we need to give better guidance around those. And we, we suggested developing a syllabus statement and templates for removal of materials from said sites. If you put an exam, even a completed exam, if it goes on Course Hero, mm -hmm. that is your slash Penn State's intellectual property, depending on the circumstances around that class. They do not have copyright permission to upload that material to Course Hero. So you can issue a takedown notice. Yeah. Sure. I mean, this is going to be part of the presentation later, like what is Course Hero? Because honestly, I don't even know what yeah, you're talking we'll, about. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so tools and services to help. So first of all, uh, we have a university license for Turnitin. It is integrated into Canvas. You can create an assignment in Canvas using Turnitin. If it's a paper or an essay or some kind of a writing assignment, students upload that assignment into the Turnitin interface from right within Canvas. Turn it in, checks that thing for plagiarism. It flags it, and then it's up to the instructor to decide, does this rise to the level of plagiarism? Was this an accident, et cetera? One thing that a lot of faculty members don't know is that you can actually set up in your class, turn it in so that students can upload their paper before they turn it in to check themselves. So students can use it as a tool to say, before I turn this in for credit, did I accidentally plagiarize? And in those cases, it doesn't go into the central Turnitin database. So you can, um, students, it, it's a good check to set it up that way as well. Also, it might encourage them to not do things at the last minute if they want to upload it to Turnitin and get a report and then have a chance to revise it before they actually turn it in. Yeah. I uh, actually took a grad class where we, we were required to do that mm -hmm. and just submit evidence that we did, uh -huh. which, again meant we couldn't wait till the last minute because we had to like a couple weeks before the thing was due show that we put a draft in, in then in turn it in which i thought was a nice strategy another one i did not know until i was on this committee and this probably won't affect most people here moss is an open source plagiarism detector for computer code so it's used a lot in engineering and ist um it's out of stanford i think um, but you can actually upload it and it'll know it'll know if somebody's you know if they were supposed to write a program on something they'll know if they pulled code from somewhere else. Um, again, use the testing center for quizzes and exams, monitor Course Hero and other sites. Course Hero, it, it builds itself as a study site. It says, get notes from other students, search for a course at Penn State. If you look for your class, 
10 to 1, there will be hundreds of copies of exams, labs, papers students have written, because the way they get free entry to Course Hero is it's an upload or pay. So if you upload materials, you get free access to the site for so long, and then you have to keep uploading things. Um, many students we've discovered, and I don't want this secret to get out, but many students use their Penn State Access Account user ID as their ID in Course Hero. Okay, <laughs> but that makes them really easy to find. Is there an official university policy on They're not supposed to use their password. They're not supposed to use the course zero in general. Like I'm not using course oh, zero. Oh, it's yeah. a course copyright. If the student actually took notes in your class, they own those notes. If they want to upload those to Course Hero, that's perfectly legal. Okay. If they but they can't take if I put a PowerPoint. That's um, nope. That's university that copyright. They can't do it. So why doesn't the university pursue this? The university pursues one. That we we had this discussion a couple years ago actually. If the university, this is, goes back to the intellectual property thing. If the university owns the intellectual property of the class, it's an online class that you developed in conjunction with the Dutton Institute, then the university will issue the takedown notice. Okay. If it's something you did on your own, like it's a regular class that you teach and those are your materials, then the university expects you to issue the takedown okay. notice. There is a template letter for that, which we have at this college and um, can be distributed again, but it's basically your standard wording for takedown. And they're pretty fast about taking things down, but it's an arms race. As fast as you take stuff down, students put it back up. So the best option is change things up often enough so it's not going to help Does them. Does the takedown notice go to course, course zero, zero. student? Course, course zero. zero. Yeah. A question from online. Someone is wondering if uh, faculty can access course zero without paying and or uploading. Yes, if you tell them and you're and if you contact them and tell them that you're an educator and you need to check for copyrighted materials on your class, they will give you a free account. Yeah, so you do not have to pay. Yeah, because I feel like kind of strongly that I don't want to pay them for what I feel is encouraging bad behavior. I think our college has a, a statement, a standard statement that we can put on our syllabus. It's on our fact website. Yes, it is a required statement, the copyright statement that's in the required syllabus statements. That's meant to cover Course Heroes. So maybe going over that in class the first day would be a useful thing. Yeah. But if you do discover that a student has uploaded a bunch of stuff for your class, yes. things like that. There's no action you can take against that student. I consider it facilitating it's cheating. on your syllabus that it's not allowed. Yeah, you yeah, absolutely yeah, may. Yeah. Uh, it's not academic integrity. Yeah. 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 Study Lib is a new one. I, that seems to be a new site. It's very bare bones. I'm trying to go really Study quickly. Lib? Sorry. Study Lib. Okay. Net. Studylib.net is another new one. Um, there is a Preventing Academic Integrity Issues website. The Dutton Institute manages it. It's on our FactDev site. So that FactDev.e-education, I send out links to that all the time to people. If you go on there, there's a whole page on Preventing Academic Integrity Issues, and, and uh, April's going to be talking more about that. And then the other thing you can do is request a consultation with one of our learning designers. We do that fairly often. It's not a big deal. You don't have to be working with us for any other reason. You can say, hey, I have this assignment, I've had issues, I'd really like to talk to somebody about how I might reconfigure this assignment in order to do things. And if you want to do that, just email me and I'll set you up with somebody with some time. The report was submitted and accepted. There is now a new committee, because the university, um, called the Academic Integrity Committee, and a, a lot of higher-ups are on that. They have the report and the survey results, and I've actually also given them some more of the raw data on their request. So I'm hopeful that over the course of that committee, we will end up with a solution that is free and available to everyone that wants to use it for anything that they want. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Alan. <laughs> so I have one more question about Coursera. Yeah. So a student writes their solutions to my right. homework yep. and uploads their solutions to Coursera. Right. That's facilitating academic integrity. Ah, actually. so I can I can say that this is an yeah. academic integrity issue, even though it's not a copyright issue. Martha? Yes. <laughs> you're, if They're you're facilitating answers to other students. That's one of the things. The other issue yeah. where it gets sticky is it's hard to, if you discover it after the students already left your class, like they're already not in your class anymore, 
that's harder, right, Martha? Because why? It's isn't it meant like? Can you do it retroactively after the semester's I, over? Yeah, that. we have I once have, again. Have we've we successfully prosecuted a case. Okay, I think well, we're getting into okay. September's okay. talk. But yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm satisfied. Thank okay. you. This course, this course here, I think, is quite illuminating. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, not uh, all my so, hi, I'm Alan, and uh, my job here today is to talk for, from in the trenches, if you will. Um, in, in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, we've actually been gathering data on this concept of cheating and academic integrity for about the last two and a half years. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Roman Eagle Herbert, Allison BC and um, Lauren Zarzar for helping with this process. Um, so basically the, the reality that we've come to in our, in our curriculum and assessment committee for the department is that any assessment that's not performed in front of the instructor and or in a controlled environment is not an accurate assessment of what our students know. And that's because of the sharing of information which we would then call cheating or misrepresentation. And we've discussed this as faculty, uh, we, we've done the data studies, and I've created this plot to sort of show you one of, some of the things that we're seeing. So in several of our courses, and one of the reasons we started doing this is because in the last five years, our core courses have gone from 50 or 60 students to 120, 130 students. And um, so what we did is we started looking at specific courses and we would plot the student homework average as a function of the student exam average and one would imagine that in an ideal world they would fall somewhere along that red line how they're doing in the homework is how they're doing on the exams in fact you can divide this plot into four different areas so we have our overachievers and our underachievers all right so studying doing the homework and doing well not doing their homework but just good at taking exams then, of course, you have the cadre of students who are just completely lost. But this upper left-hand corner is really interesting. And what we've been finding in these larger courses, i.e. more than 100 students, is that upwards to 30% of the class mm -hmm. will fall in this sector. So they have literally a homework average that's almost twice their exam average. And one may argue that, okay, maybe we have an issue with test anxiety or something of that nature, but those numbers seem unrealistic. Um, but part of the solution is trying to address the test anxiety issue, too. So here are some things. Oops, I went the wrong way, too. It's interesting. Awesome. Yeah, okay. So, um, so here are some of the things that we are recommending with our faculty that teach these core courses. So first, we don't want, we still want to give homework because homework is a very important active learning uh, strategy. And so we're still giving the same amount of homework, but what we're doing is decreasing its impact on the final grade. And so we're recommending that no more than 15% of the final grade is actually a homework score. Um, and then to address the concerns of, oh, maybe some of this is test anxiety. We're encouraging our faculty, most faculty, it's an interesting rule of thumb, I don't know where it came from, but they give two midterms and a final. It's pretty commonplace. So what we're encouraging them to do is try to up that to four or five exams or quizzes during the semester, typically allowing the student to drop the lowest score from one of them, and all of this together starts to lower that anxiety level. Additionally, giving those exams at night where you have an hour and a half window, but you design an exam that could, should be completed in say 70, 75 minutes. So you're also trying to get a bucket there. Um, another thing that we've started doing is the students, instead of turning in the homework for the grade, we actually have them take a homework quiz. And in a lot of cases, that homework quiz is online. Now for my courses, I actually, on the quiz, will ask, the exact same question they had in an open-ended homework, but I will then present them with multiple choice answers and they have two minutes or less to answer the question. So I tell them up front, you need to complete the homework before you do the quiz because if you're trying to work the problems when you open the quiz, there's no way in the world you'll have enough time to finish. 
So do the homework before, and then you'll go through, yes, question one, I got A. Question two, I got D. And it's boom, boom, boom. All right? Um, some of our faculty are using these homework quizzes, but not using the same, using the same questions, but different numbers. Or rearranging. So in the homework, I asked them to calculate Bragg's angle. And in the homework quiz, I'm going to ask them to calculate the D space. I'm just manipulating the same equation. Um, we've included participation grade. This is pretty much universal across our core classes now because we want to encourage attendance. And we feel like encouraging attendance gives a better performance and lessens the anxiety and the desire to cheat. Um, the other thing that we've been doing with this, of course, is taking data on how the students perform in these usually eye clicker questions that we're using to gauge participation. Once again, we could develop an entire plot of attendance as a function of class average, and you would see the relationship that you would expect to see. Um, but in addition, we've also um, been designing eye clicker questions such that we begin every lecture with a retention question. So in the first two minutes of class, we're going to ask an eye clicker question. And your attendance to class is based on you answering that question. So if you come in five minutes late and you miss that question, but you answered the other three questions during the class, we don't care. As far as we're concerned, you weren't there. So it's really sort of fascinating because now what we see is students running into class, pressing <laughs> regardless of whether it's right or wrong, but they want to be there and be in part of the quiz. But once again, we're, we're still breaking this data down. There's a lot of data to look at, but looking at how are they performing on that retention question, and then periodically through the lecture, we will ask concept questions, right? Are you getting what I'm talking about? Um, so we're trying to hit them every, 10 to 15 minutes in the lecture. So I, I call it re-grabbing their attention. Um, and, and that seems to be giving us some interesting stuff that we're still working through that day. Um, other things that we're in, in, in putting in place, which are sort of obvious, um, but multiple versions of an exam. If you're giving an exam in person, there still needs to be multiple versions of that. I, and, and it's fairly straightforward to do. I mean, you can rearrange questions, rearrange answers. It's, it's not that much more work once you have the original exam written. And then in online classes, it's imperative that you give unique exams to each individual student. And you do that by using <coughs> question groups. And then Canvas randomly chooses questions within that group to give to an individual student. And um, I can tell you that what I've seen in this implementation is um, with Maxi 201, uh, we've seen a decrease in the exam average of about eight to nine points by implementing this method. What's interesting is that the range of scores has not changed, but the standard deviation has decreased by 35%. And then the average time on the exam has increased by 20 minutes. So, so it definitely makes a difference. Um, so anyway, so this is, this is what's going on in, in materials. Um, and, you know, some of these things we've just implemented in the last year. We've been collecting data for a while. But we're just now starting to use it to make changes. Um, but anyway, so that's my story. Um, and I'll, I'll take any questions now or later on things that we've been trying. Yeah. Um, another strategy that I'm wondering if you've tried, um, flipping the classroom so that outside of class they're maybe, you know, doing more readings or watching, uh, you know, or listening to video or, or, or using reading something. So they're getting you know, the lecture yeah. outside of class and then using class time for the to homework. Do more of the assessments. I mean, that's yeah. an interesting idea. Um, and, and another thing that we've uh, been playing around with but have not implemented was this idea of quick quizzes. Mm -hmm. So for example, we, instead of a homework quiz, um, I mean, we're fortunate enough to have an, an incredible computer facility downstairs on the first floor. That computer facility could handle a class of 120 within an hour if you, inv if you divided them up into three sections 
they came in in a proctored environment, took a 20 minute quiz on the homework. And so in an hour, you would have assessed the entire class. So yeah, so we've been, yeah, we've been thinking about different ways of so flipping the classroom is an interesting idea. Well, if you, and if you do the quizzes and assessments online, that it can lower the grading burden. So I mean, the problem, with my, the problem with my class is that the grading burden gets very high yes. for more frequent exams and more frequent homeworks. But I like this idea of you assign a homework, people can go and work on it, and then you give a homework quiz that's you know frequent enough but high stakes. Either you know it or you don't, right. um, and that can be done online. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Absolutely, uh, where I still keep my paper and pencil exams because I, I mean I study the exams because I want to know how the students absolutely are doing, right? right I mean you get some really good feedback but I would encourage you I mean this is something that I talk with my faculty all the time about of this idea of going to multiple choice everybody is loath to do that but the fact of the matter is is done right and done carefully you can get the same data you can get the same feedback on knowledge and and weaknesses and strengths on a properly designed test and, and of course the, the learning uh, support and instructors and Dutton can give you a lot of insight into that. The Schreier Institute for Teaching Excellence Vendels, uh, offers some wonderful workshops on making multiple choice exams too. Oh, so, how automatic is the iClicker integration with the great book and campus is it still all done by hand because that's also well, a big burden so um i probably have not perfected it but what i do it's, it's fairly straightforward so the iClicker software collects what happens real time in the classroom yep. in canvas i already have my grade book designed to accept those ah, scores okay i download that grade book from Canvas, I put in the iClicker stuff, copy and paste, and then I upload it back to Canvas. Canvas says, oh, okay, here are the scores. So you, but you don't have to go one at a time. You just no, have to manipulate no, you can just copy. It's all okay. an Excel spreadsheet okay. battle at that point. That, yeah. that's, that's easier than Yeah, it's fairly straightforward. Okay. The, key, the key is having the grade book built before the fact. Got it. And then trying not to change it. But well, yeah, the grade book, I mean, means that you know what all the assignments are and everything else. So exactly. you build in maybe a couple of dummies right. if you need it. Okay. Right, yeah. Okay, so Stevie talked kind of big picture, what the university's doing, some tools, those kinds of things. Alan talked about something very, very specific and what he did in his class. So what I'm gonna talk about are practical strategies that basically anybody can use in their class. And they're broken up into loosely into, some of these kind of overlap, but into four categories. Communication, what research says it works, how to use design to actually help, and then some tools that will, will help you. I'm gonna focus on Canvas since that is where a lot of us kind of spend a lot of our time. So communication is totally key for this. It's absolutely imperative. And so the more you communicate with your students about academic integrity and what is going to happen, and as clearly as possible, the better chances that you're gonna reduce academic integrity in your class. And so you can add a statement to your syllabus um, require students to read and sign an academic integrity quiz at the beginning of the class. Some will actually go beyond that and have them sign an academic integrity uh, statement before they take every single exam, turn any assignment in. It's just constant, constant reminder. Uh, set expectations about all of this stuff super early in the class. As soon as you start talking to them, in the first email you send out to them, just keep reminding them throughout the entire semester. So don't talk about it the first week of class and then never mention it again. You just need to keep reminding them. Um, and so- It actually shows that if you say in an assignment, by clicking this box or by answering yes to this question, I certify that I'll work on this assignment in my own. Doing it right within the assignment tends to reduce academic integrity. Just putting that one question in. Yeah. Reduce academic integrity. Violation. <laughs> <laughs> <Violations. laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. I forgot my noun. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I got it. Another thing I would just add, having just had my second kiddo start at Penn State, is they don't don't assume they know what it is. Yeah. And it's how they're violating it. it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they, they probably weren't taught very well about this in high school. So a lot of people, you know, in, as part of everything's April saying, it is also educating them. Yes. And, and frankly, my daughter came home, she was a freshman last year, and she called me, she goes, oh, my friend told me to sign up for this great site, it's called Tour Sierra, it's there to help you. And I was like, no! <laughs> like, they don't know that that's, that's not cheap. what it is, because that's not what it is. So, yeah. So what, re re what research says reduces cheating? So one of the things that as I was reading some stuff to kind of prepare for this presentation is that developing good rapport with students is key to reducing um, academic integrity issues. Because if they know you, they feel they have a relationship with you, they are, they are not going to want to disappoint you. And so the same goes if they have really good relationships with, their, with the peers in their class, they're not going to like cheat off of those, those peers. And so that rapport within the classroom is super important. Um, something else that has bubbled up in some of the reading I've been doing is linking academic integrity to professional integrity is also very important. So you wouldn't cheat on something or turn somebody else's work in on a job that you're getting paid for. So why would you do that in your academic class? And so trying to link those as much as you can, something that kind of goes along with that is uh, setting up um, like an honor code for your class and kind of have everybody work towards that and understand that, talk about that early on. That also fits right into that um, kind of integrity mm -hmm. issue. Um, using students' intrinsic motivation. I think most students want to do a good job. That's just something that they do. So figure out ways to actually do some virtue integration into when you're meeting with students and talking to students and writing it in your syllabus and all of those sorts of things. Take that like intrinsic motivation seriously and figure out ways to kind of just remind students about that. And um, your research says that that will reduce cheating. Another thing that Alan actually talked about was reducing test anxiety. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can do this. He talked about a lot of them. But just giving students like maybe a practice exam every now and then or giving them more chances to get points throughout the semester than having three chances. Two midterms and a final freaks students out because those individual assessments are worth so much of their grade. They are going to do whatever they have to to do well in that exam. And that includes cheating. Yes. Does anyone in here teach first year seminar? And if so, are these concepts mentioned in that class? So, Stevie Johnson. Yes, yes. So, so we're, yes, and we're in for this is new for this fall. But the Academic Integrity Committee, um, Eugene and Brandy, and I'm working with Stevie, have put together a presentation. They can come to your classroom and get it. This is for anyone teaching the class, by the way. Right. Well, I'm actually proposing something even more dramatic. I propose that every first year seminar instructor should be given a 10 to 15 minute presentation that they should be required to show, period. I, I think we're headed in that direction, John. So our goal this beginning of the fall is to first come to the faculty with all our new procedures and ideas based on the current wrap up and cases that we've had in the past two years. It gets more complicated too because we also have to catch those students coming from the branch campuses. So we're going to come to 421, 300. We're going to try to catch them everywhere. Well, you're never going to. We're going to have that problem, but I, I would say you should do something for the right the students who begin here at University Park. That's where it should. Absolutely. That's where it should be set. Yeah. And, and I think this first year, when we develop the, the talk, we're going to propose to come ourselves, people from the committee. We'll see how it goes. We'll work with the faculty and we'll design something exactly along the lines of what you're saying for the following year. The library has developed an online uh, badge sort of credential for students. And then it's an online training module that, that walks them through uh, the rules governing academic integrity at, at the university. And I'm requiring it in my fall class, even though it's 100 dollars because they wouldn't have gotten this elsewhere yet. And we're going to be integrating it into our orientation class for our major. But that might be another way to, to capture students, require them. If it, 
it, it's like some of the online training that, that we do related to you know mandatory reporting and things like that. You have to you have to go through these these modules and then at the end it says it quizzes you and either you pass it or you don't need to go back. I don't think that's as effective as no, having I mean, someone come to the seminar. I think it needs to be delivered by a faculty member. <laughs> yeah. Personally. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so right along with the research is how can you use pedagogy and learning design or instructional design to actually build in um, the reduction of academic integrity issues. So one of the ways is to use more authentic assessments. If you're making assessments harder to cheat on and having them actually do something more than the things that are really easy to grade, chances are it's gonna be harder to cheat on those things. Um, setting achievable assignments. So if a student feels that an assignment is just completely out of the realm of their ability to do it, or you're assigning a 50 page paper for a one week every week or something like that, like crazy kind of things, they're gonna cheat on that stuff because they're gonna feel that they don't have any chance to be able to do well on that assignment. You're always gonna have the overachievers that will and they just you know, will do it, but a lot of them, if they feel that that assignment is just not achievable, they're not gonna, uh, they're, they're gonna find ways around it. Uh, spreading assignments over the entire semester. So you don't wanna have all of the assignments due at the end of the semester because that is just like, students aren't very good at time management. So they're going to just not, they're gonna wait until the last minute. So having them turn in drafts for something that's a very large project, having them, you know, giving them uh, like very low stakes quizzing along the way, having more exams, those kinds of things that Alan has been talking about, those things will actually help reduce. You know how there's generally a midterm season for the semester right. where everybody's, been, maybe movie works, right? So it's yeah. not at the same time as everybody else. Um, change assessments out each semester. And for, for faculty, this can be a bit of a pain. Yes, it's, it is, because you're gonna have to think of a new way to like um, assess the same thing over and over again. But what that does is if you're giving a different assessment, they can't cheat on it. So using peer review sometimes will ha have an impact on reducing um, academic integrity. If students are looking at each other's work, they're going to want to make that work as unique and as good as possible because their peers are going to be like judging them as well as well as the faculty members. So maybe you use the um, peer review and the draft together and that's kind of what you do a peer review and then that's the first draft and then they turn in the next draft to the faculty member. It might help with some of that stuff. Um, providing detailed feedback to students. This is shown that it will actually help reduce the amount of uh, cheating that goes on because then they can take that feedback and integrate it into what they're doing. And they, that helps with the feeling of connection to the faculty member. Because if you always give canned feedback to students, they're gonna figure that out because students talk. And so um, that is something that is pretty valuable. And something that's kind of like just makes sense to a learning designer, but make sure that you're linking your objectives to your assignments. So what that does is the students feel that those assignments are achieving something. You know, they told me that I, this is what I'm gonna learn in the class and by gosh, there's an assignment that is actually helping me learn what I was supposed to get out of this class. They see value in that and they don't feel that their time is being wasted and they're they're going to be less likely to cheat. If you're worried about course hero too, if you do exams or you do labs, even if you change out only a third of the questions each time you teach, by the third round it's completely new. So it's not, you don't have to do the whole thing every single time, but if you have a bunch of questions that you were asking and you swapped out a third, a third, a third, by the time you've done it three times it's a brand new assessment and that also makes it harder for them to upload. So what can, what can you do in Canvas? Because a lot of the assessment um, and grading and everything actually happens in Canvas. These are just some things that learning designers in Dutton talk to the faculty that we work with about. So using randomization. You know, if you have a quiz, randomize the order that the questions come in, randomize the order that the answers come in. 
And so, and write better questions. So within that randomization, having both A and B or all of the above or none of the above, get rid of those kind of answers because what that does is it makes you have to have the question in the exact same order every single time. So if you get rid of that stuff, it'll help make that a little bit easier. It also makes the question easier to eliminate one thing. They know it's not all of the Yeah, good point. Um, require posting first before seeing others for discussion forums. So there's always that one student that wants to be the first to do everything. They're the overachiever. They go in there, they answer their question. And then if, you, if they get to see that answer, then all the other students in the class read what they said because they know they're that student. And then they just paraphrase what that student said. And then you end up with not very unique sounding responses to discussion forums. So um, avoid simplistic or Googleable um, questions because you have a phone, you have a computer, whatever the case may be, somebody can say, oh, well, that's a, you know, what is blah, 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 blah. Try to make questions a little bit more um, less simple. You know, make them think about it. Make them really kind of evaluate, well, okay, so in this I learned about that, and so maybe it's this, and so they have to really think about it. It's not just like a memorization thing. Um, show one question at a time and not the answers on exams. Um, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, use tighter time limits. So instead of giving somebody an it, yes. Can we go back to show it? I'm not sure that's okay. self-explanatory. Okay, <laughs> so when you when you have an exam, show one question at a time instead of showing all 20 questions. Oh, this is if you're doing something online. Obviously yes. You can't do that. Yeah, that so wouldn't work in, yes. And when you say no answers, you mean that when they submit the the test, yes. it doesn't tell them. Doesn't tell them. That's what I didn't yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think it's important to Makes note sense. that I'm pretty sure the default from Canvas is to give them the feedback immediately. Uh -huh. So this is a setting you have to change, yeah. or it will automatically give them the right answer as soon as possible. Good point, Brandy. Thank you. And the wording is confusing. If you set that date to provide them feedback it, to show them correct answers, they still can see the correct answers if, if they got it right. Right? So. If I take an exam and I know whether I got it right or wrong and I got it right, well then I know that I got it right. That mm -hmm. question. So eliminating all that until after your quiz right. closes yeah. will help with that too. Yeah. Um, using tighter time limits. So if you have like a 20 question quiz, don't give them 90 minutes to, to take the test unless they really need the 90 minutes to take the test. You know, that, that kind of gets thrown out the windows if you have any students that have special needs and those sorts of things, but handle those students individually, and Canvas makes that pretty easy now to do. Um, instead of just saying, oh, well, I've got one student that needs time and a half, so I'll just give everybody 90 minutes for the quiz. It doesn't work. It doesn't really work that way. So make sure that the time limits go with the difficulty of the quiz that you're giving. Um, use a logarithmic equations. So algorithmic equations, I always say that word wrong, um, in your assessments. And so what that will allow you to do is for students to actually have very different exams when they're taking the exam. So they're getting, different, they're getting different data, they're getting different information, still the same question, but what they're being asked to do with it is different. Yes? Yeah, I'm probably exposing my own ignorance. What, are, what do you mean by algorithmic equations? Algorithmic equations are ones where you can actually have it, like if you're doing a mathematical type of a problem, um, I'm going to use slope intercept, y equals mx plus b, because that's about all I can remember from algebra. Um, you can say, give these values for m within this range, and then it will randomly, and then you can say how many decimal points, and it will randomly give a student a question with a number that they have to then solve, and it will know what the answers are. So for example, like you can, you can have them do the math, but you would have them each have a little bit of the same formula, but a little bit different math, they have different numbers. So when they put the answer in, and then you can say how many digits the answer has to come back in. You can also do, you can't in Canvas do multi-step formulaic questions where like the answer to one question is the input to another, but the Dutton Institute has built a system to do that because we knew our faculty members needed it. So if anybody wants to do multi-step formulaic questions, Talk to me and we'll set you up with a system that will let you do that. Um, 
change out questions each semester. And CD was kind of talking about this. So if you change like a third of your questions each, sem each semester, by year three, you've got an entirely different exam and you're building a question bank uh, as you're going along. And that's my next thing is to create question banks. And so what these do is um, they allow you to have multiple questions. And so on your, on your quiz or your exam, you say, okay, I'm gonna set up question banks for, for these different questions. And then you say, okay, I need two about this topic, three about this topic, four about this topic, and then it will pull those and different students will get different questions. So what you have to be very careful with, with related to this, is you need to make sure that you are giving students questions at the same level. So you don't want to give some, you know, because you could have one student get all the easy questions and one student get all the hard questions and you've got two very different exams. And so um, there's a way to make sure that you're doing that properly and it is called uh, using an assessment blueprinting thing. But I have another slide next that will talk about, that, um, that will show you kind of how that works. So this is a table that I found. So if you have a number of questions, if you set your question bank up and you say, okay, I need five questions and then you've got only 10 questions in your bank, 2.5 uh, questions are gonna be common for two students. So the more questions you add to your bank, the, the less chance that students are actually gonna end up getting the same questions. So you can kind of look down through that. So that, so keep that in mind because if you only ever have like two versions of the question, chances are you're going to have students getting the same question quite a bit. So, and that could not encourage academic integrity issues and cheating, but they would be getting the same questions. And what you want to do with your question banks is give students different questions randomly so they don't know, but making sure that those questions are at the same level. So everybody's getting, you know, a knowledge question and you don't have one student getting a knowledge question and then you're asking somebody else to apply something in the same question. Does that make sense? Okay. I, I have a question. So scheduling our um, computing facilities sometimes is difficult for when you'd like to give an online quiz. Mm -hmm. Where are we with requiring students to bring a screen with them to class because that's how we're going to do the quiz. I mean, can we can we require that, or are we not there yet? I don't think. No. I think we're still a four-year old device university to some extent. And but but can we require? I mean, well, I, I I'm actually assuming that most students probably have one, but I would do a, I would put that in the end like initial survey the first day of class. Yeah. Yeah, how many, if they all have one, then yes, required. Mm -hmm. I don't know but, what, the, what the current. Uh, statistics are but when we when the university has done surveys in the past it certainly is most students but i don't but it's I, I not all anyone at a disadvantage yeah right? exactly you can't disincentivize the yeah. can't you the, borrow one from the library though? that's what i was going to suggest is okay. that um, multimedia technology support services has computers you can you check can out. you can check out so maybe you do what stevie's saying you survey your class how many of you have a laptop you could bring to class and you know, if three people don't, Does then Canvas, Canvas you know, you, they you can do it on their phones. They yes. can do it on almost yep. anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I don't. I, and then you're getting closer to 100. percent Yeah. I mean, then the idea is that I don't have to schedule our computing facilities, but I can do automatic assessments in class that I don't get a big stack of papers right. that I have to grade after class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we do have on, on this slide, I mentioned the, the blueprinting. And so what that is, is it's, you look at your objectives, you look at, can I actually go there? I wonder. Let's see if I can, no, I guess I can. Okay. So this is on our fact of site, which CV mentioned a little bit early earlier. And so what you do, um, mm -hmm, is we'll just go down to the bottom one where it's filled out. So what your goal is here, across the top, you have 
Bloom's taxonomy. So are your questions of knowledge questions, comprehension, application, analysis, that synthesis, or evaluation? And then down the left side are the objectives for the course. Um, and then for each objective, you kind of pull out the topic. So what were the topics that you kind of got to with your objective? And so what you do is say, okay, I need one knowledge question about aquifer basics, two comprehension. So that's a total of three questions. And so you just kind of do this for your class and identify those things. It also helps you figure out whether or not you're giving them an exam at the correct level for what you really want to teach them. Yeah. And so then at the end of this, you know how many questions you need. And so what you can do then is to use this and a question bank together. So if you need... If you want three... If you want, for every one question, you want three possible choices, then you need to write three aquifer basics, you need to write six comprehension level aquifer basics. And that ensures that every student, because of the way you set up the question pools, mm -hmm. get an evenly difficult test. No one can get an artificially easy one, no one can get an artificially hard one, because there's the same number of questions at every level, and you double check to make sure that you're actually testing them at the level that you think you and so what you would end up with is probably, uh, whoops. Oh, there we go. Oh, jeez. I am really bad at this thing. So what you're going to end up with is probably, I guess you would end up with probably two question banks for that. Yeah, you would have two. And you would have two for two this for one, that. two for that one. You have to have one. one for every topic that yeah. you're looking at. So if you are... You probably would never do this, but you could end up having like six question banks for each one of those topics, which you probably would never do because you wouldn't want all of those things in the same for the same topic, I don't think. Um, and so it gives you really a blueprint on what you need to do once you get into Canvas. So you're gonna know. And so whether you're making three questions for each one of those things, some people have like I think Dr. Alley has what, ten? 10 questions for each one of his, yeah, yeah, and so, and instead of doing those all at the same time, add one, add two each, each time you teach the class, and then you'll have a nice question bank at the end, and so students might end up getting those questions, but they're not going to know which one they get, but if you give the same exam every single time, they're going to, you know, be able to cheat a lot more easily, so that's what question banks are really helpful for that. Okay, so how do I go back now? Um, the uh, oh, 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 there it is. Okay. So we do have some Earth Mineral Science resources. There's an EMS Academic Integrity Information page. There, we also have a lot of information on the Dutton uh, website. Uh, we have academic integrity resources and then information about academic integrity. And there's a bunch of other ones there, but those ones really kind of encapsulate everything that we've kind of talked about today. Um, and these were just some sources in case you're interested in like where some of the, the uh, theory came from and some of the suggestions and strategies. There's a bunch of things there when we send that out. So we don't have much time for questions and answers, but we have been answering questions as we've gone along, so hopefully that's, that will and if work. If anybody wants a, a consultation with a designer, send me an email. I'm senior at PSU.edu. I'm prepared to have the superlative. So you can email me and I'll say it. April, where yeah. will, and, and Jane, where will the, this PowerPoint live so that people can click on those links? We have a, a food for thought uh, section on the website on the that, practice on the practice site that will post that this recording of this presentation to and um, and the PowerPoint there and then we can also send an email especially if you remember to sign in which looks like just whatever you ask we can send you all did you not get that um, we can send this out to the yes, folks as well yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, over here sorry yes I have a request for the next follow-up um, session, and I, I know I've asked Jane about this, but maybe there's an update. Um, Turnitin is useful for, for looking at whether a student has plagiarized something that's already out there in the internet. It does not allow me to compare assignments within that group of assignments that we're turning. 
And that is to me the most important thing because there's what I so teach each other. Right. The cheating yes. that I uncover is two students who turn in the same, same paper. Mm -hmm. I so if there's some way to do that, that would be the I most useful share. I think it will help that. Mm -hmm. No, it does. If, if you go if you go to their help site, it specifically says this is not designed to compare assignments to the same assignment group. I understand, but I've had cases where a student submits their assignment with everyone else when it's due and I upload them all the time with it and, and look at them. And then that student realizes they sent me a draft, not their final version. And so they do send it to me. And as soon as I upload their second one, it flags it as a, as a full match to the one they had already submitted. I don't know. I had two assignments that were identical. And when I uploaded it, it did not rent. What if it's because it's a second upload? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe put them all together. Yeah, and then it's better. And then it was the second upload right. compared to the first upload. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe this was this was prior to using the, the integration and in the table. I'm not sure how that will work. Upload them individually. But it'll upload them individually, so it might it might catch them. Well, you could you could mm -hmm. contest it. You could try that. I want to be respectful of people's times and I appreciate everybody coming with one. We'll stick around for more questions if you have more. Um, but it is one o'clock, so if you have something else going on, yeah, sure. if, you, if you do want to stay, we can continue the conversation. Yes, and there are more cupcakes. So thank you all for coming. Yes.